This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. $20 oil? A well-known Wall Street firm says it's possible as the world remains awash in crude. Life-saving information. That's how federal health officials are describing a study on blood pressure that could not only impact one in three Americans, but also a major part of the drug industry. Market monitor why a five-star fund manager has big hopes for small cap stocks. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Friday, September the 11th. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Bill Griffith in tonight for Tyler Matheson. And I'm Sue Herrera. Always good to have you with Thank us. Thank you for having me back. Well, we begin with oil tonight and a new government, a new report, rather, from Goldman Sachs that says there is a chance prices could plummet to $20 a barrel, and the probability of that happening is rising. The reasons, according to the firm, are pretty simple. Persistent oversupply with few signs of letting up. And that report was part of the reason why crude futures fell 3 percent today to settle at 44 dollars a barrel. But not everybody agrees with that scenario. Jackie DeAngelis has more from the New York Mercantile Exchange. The crude reality when it comes to oil, $20 a barrel, according to Goldman Sachs. Goldman's latest crude note entitled Lower for Longer said the potential for oil prices to fall to 20 is increasingly likely as storage continues to fill. There's a lot of uncertainty on what level will create the rebalancing in the market. It could be U.S. production. $40 a barrel, which is where our base case is, is set, is the levels at which you see a drop in drilling. We saw it today in terms of the rig counts. However, if you don't bring U.S. production or global production down low enough underneath demand to create that rebalancing, then you're likely to slam into storage capacity constraints, and that would put that downward pressure. Due to increased supply from the U.S. shale players, Goldman's base case calls for $38 oil in a month, $42 in three months, $40 in six months, and $45 in a year. But some are skeptical. I personally think the oil is not going to go that much lower here. I think once we get to these levels, the market is very susceptible to the upside. Now you'll see an increase in consumption. You'll see some uh, backing off in production. And that's how markets work. So at these levels, it's not that improbable to think this market could go up. Just this week, both the Energy Information Agency and the International Energy Agency lowered forecasts for U.S. production. The EIA seeing nearly 9 million barrels a day by 2016, and the IEA seeing output declining for non-OPEC producers at its steepest rate in two decades next year. If oil prices were to go down to $20 a barrel, that could be great news for consumers, bringing the national average for a gallon of regular gas to possibly $1.12. We haven't seen that since 2002. This is according to the Oil Price Information Service. So for the moment, it's anyone's guess. There was a time when Goldman called for $200 oil, and it was a no-show. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. And there's another problem for oil that could come from the nation's refiners. Kate Kelly explains why from the now famous Whiting Refinery in Indiana. It's the largest in the Midwest and the seventh largest around the nation. Now that the all-important summer driving season is over, some gasoline manufacturers are taking the opportunity to do much-needed repairs. All around the Midwest in places like Ponca City, Oklahoma, St. Paul Park, Minnesota, and Coffeyville, Kansas, refineries, facilities that convert crude oil into forms of gasoline like diesel, unleaded, and jet fuel, are taking some or all of their operations offline to do what they call turnarounds or seasonal maintenance. Such maintenance, which typically needs to be done every three to five years, is not unusual and is in fact essential to keeping the refineries running smoothly. But oil producers and analysts are paying particularly close attention this year because the crude prices in the U.S. have taken such a beating. And they note that with refineries, who are some of the biggest buyers of crude oil, slowing their purchases during this repair process, the lack of demand could create yet another leg down in U.S. oil. Here in Whiting, Indiana, where BP runs a major refiner, an unexpected mechanical issue forced a temporary outage in August, shooting up gas prices in the area and frustrating motorists. BP has the plant back up and running now, but it's soon to go into seasonal maintenance anyway, which will almost certainly slow its crude purchases for a time. Analysts, however, say not to worry too much about a hike in pump prices this time around. For one thing, the long-term planning that goes into seasonal repairs means that gas providers have time to look for alternative fuel suppliers. 
For another, kids are back to school and prime vacation time is over, meaning that consumer demand is likely to be lower anyway. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Kelly in Whiting, Indiana. And our next guest says there's a chance gasoline prices could fall to $1.50 a gallon. He is Kyle Cooper, Director of Research with IAF Advisors, and energy research firm. Welcome, Kyle. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Sue. So what's going to drive it to $1.50, and what do you think of Goldman's projections that we could see much lower crude and gasoline prices? You know, the, the latest weekly data has shown a tightening of the supply-demand balance, but as they pointed out, it really hasn't tightened quick enough. So inventories continue to build, and thus, uh, you know, that, that's obviously going to be a negative to the market overall. Now, I would say that the spike from two weeks ago to 37.75, prices ha have held up, uh, and the market has, has kind of found a little bit of a footing overall, but today's price action was, was weak. And uh, as just mentioned, uh, this, this refinery maintenance season, by most accounts, is going to be rather large, meaning there's more refineries taken offline. Those headlines every week on Wednesday when the EA publishes their, their data of large crude builds are probably going to put a little bit of a negative sentiment into the market. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is what uh, could possibly drive down those prices. Uh, so I'm a little confused, though. If they take those refiners offline for maintenance purposes, why would gasoline prices go down? Because you're taking that much gasoline off the inventories. Well, as mentioned, uh, they have a lot of time to store up. There's actually not a shortage of gasoline or dis uh, of diesel right now. Right. So there's plenty of product all the way around. So it's going to be an overall market sentiment. And what uh, what, what what might keep prices uh, gasoline prices from going down much further is the fact that the crack, the differential between gasoline and crude, does widen. Just because crude is at 20 bucks doesn't mean we're going to see a dollar 50 gasoline. Right. Gasoline might hang around at dollar 75 or two dollars because, as you just mentioned, the, the supply of refined products is being reduced just as the demand for crude is. Let's look beyond the maintenance period that, that's coming up. Where do you see the longer term trend in gasoline prices, Kyle? I think we're going to see uh, uh, prices in the 250 to $3 type range. Um, they're clearly, the refiners actually just added about 55,000 barrels of capacity this last week, according to the EA. So the EA, or, or so the, the U.S. refiner continues to add capacity and keeps getting better and better at making gasoline from crude. So I don't see a real shortage in gasoline, and, and uh, I think that we'll see eventual rise to probably more like 50 or 60, but I think that's a long time away. 16, back, back half of 16, 17, even in terms of WTI prices, is there still remains a lot of supply out there uh, for, for the overall global market. Quickly, before we let you go, there's a lot of debate about what the impact these lower prices would have on, these, uh, uh, on the burgeoning industry here in the United States, which has wreaked havoc with OPEC bringing so much new oil online here. Is this going to be good or bad? Do they, they become the net losers as a result of these lower prices? Well, certainly the dynamics of, of the U.S. industry have changed tremendously from being both importers of crude and products. We're now exporters of refined products. There's a large push to try to take the uh, limitation on crude exports off so that we can, we, we can export directly crude oil. Uh, but clearly the, the dynamics have changed when the U.S. is now producing over 9 million barrels uh, and importing 7.5 million barrels. Those dynamics have changed tremendously on the effect of the overall economy. Uh, I do still think lower prices overall are great for the American economy, but they're not as good as they used to be because okay. now there's a lot less producers, there's a lot less capital expenditures by the companies here in the U.S. that was previously being spent as a result of higher oil prices. All right, we'll leave it there, Kyle. Have a great weekend. Kyle Cooper with Thank IAF you. Advisors. And the cheaper gas and the oil prices are keeping uh, inflation in check at this point. Producer prices, uh, which measures uh, price changes before they reach the consumer level, the producer price index was flat in the month of August. According to the Labor Department, wholesale gasoline prices fell by more than 7 percent last month. That was the biggest drop we've seen since January. Home heating oil prices fell 11 percent, and that helped offset the rise in prices other parts of the economy. Consumer sentiment took a tumble in September. The index fell to its lowest level in a year, as Main Street felt the effects of a very volatile stock market. The chief economist behind the survey says consumers are anticipating a weaker economy because of a slowdown abroad. New York Fed President William Dudley last month cited sentiment as a key early gauge of evidence from any kind of trouble tied to market volatility. And despite that decline in oil prices that we told you about, the major averages managed to close higher. 
The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 102 points on Friday to close at 16,433. The Nasdaq gained 26. The S&P was up 8. The Dow had its best week since late March. It gained about 2 percent. Nasdaq and the S&P had their best weeks since mid-July. Lower is better. That is the conclusion of a landmark clinical study on blood pressure that could prompt doctors to more aggressively treat patients over 50. And as Meg Terrell reports, blood pressure is a big business for the drug industry. The National Institutes of Health is calling the findings potentially life-saving. In preliminary results of a study published today, the NIH found that lowering blood pressure more than current guidelines recommend resulted in significantly reducing cardiac events and deaths among adults over 50 years old. Normal blood pressure is considered 120 over 80. That top number is known as systolic blood pressure, and that's what this study focused on. It found that lowering that top number to 120 rather than the current guidelines of 140 reduced heart attack, heart failure, and stroke by almost a third and cut the risk of death by almost a quarter. The results could have a big impact on the one in three Americans who has high blood pressure, Great. which is a leading risk factor for health problems including heart failure, stroke and kidney disease. Some experts, though, caution the results are preliminary and need to be confirmed when the study is completed. For the drug industry, high blood pressure is big business. Blood pressure medications brought in $12 billion in revenue in 2014 in the U.S., according to industry researcher IMS Health. More than 700 million prescriptions for blood pressure drugs are written annually. And though drug makers like Novartis, Pfizer, and Allergan have all worked in the space, the most popular medicines now are generic. Investor Les Funtleiter says the NIH's findings may spur more investment in developing new drugs. I'm sure data like this will encourage that sort of thing. Not, not unlike what you saw in some of the anti-infectives and antivirals, you know. Uh, data from the government tends to spur development. The initial findings of this study suggest that for blood pressure, less really may be more. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. And still ahead, a five-star fund manager who is easily outperforming the market over the past year will tell us which stocks he's investing in right now. Most cars will soon have automatic brakes. Ten automakers have now agreed to make that technology a standard feature in their new vehicles. The sensors can detect when another vehicle is stopped ahead and warn the driver. Now, if the driver doesn't react, the car will slam on the brakes. The deal was announced by the Department of Transportation. It includes Audi, BMW, Ford, General Motors, Mazda, Mercedes-Benz, Tesla, Toyota, Volkswagen, and Volvo. Meantime, the Food and Drug Administration suing new sa issuing rather new safety rules in the wake of recent foodborne illnesses and outbreaks. For the first time, food manufacturers will be required to develop plans to prevent such outbreaks, which have stemmed from contaminated fruit, spinach, and peanut butter. Corn prices rose today after a Department of Agriculture report trimmed its production estimates. The reason is adverse weather in the Midwest, but the record rain in Texas could be one of the reasons why beef prices are heading lower. Jane Wells has the story. Beef's bull run is ending. Just ask Texas rancher Phil Sadler. Market's a little softer. It's about time. Here's why beef prices shot up and are starting to come down. Four years ago, large cattle states like Texas were hit with a historic drought. That's when we first met Sadler. When you walk across these pastures, uh, it's almost like walking on crackers. The grass uh, crunches. Feeding his cattle was so expensive, he slashed his herd by a third. So did everyone else, creating a short-term glut of beef that sent prices down before they turned up, way up, with strong domestic demand and exports. Four years later, Texas has gone from drought to record rain. This is a godsend. 
And this is uh, nature syrup here. Sadler's rebuilding his herd, and so is everyone else. He said after getting record prices for his cattle last year, they're now down 15 percent. Also driving down prices, the strong dollar. Stevens reports beef exports fell 10 percent in July, with a 36 percent drop in China. And while they're not considered a big beef consuming country, there's a lot of mouths over there, and they're eating a little bit of beef. But don't expect to see prices plunge quickly. Ranchers are rebuilding their herds slowly using their own cows because buying outside cattle has gotten really expensive. Sadler says when he was liquidating his herd in 2011, he was getting about $1,000 an animal. They now cost three times that. So there's a there's a, a sizable investment involved. In fact, some states report increases in cattle stealing. It's all part of the ebb and flow of supply and demand, currencies and water. But after years of skyrocketing prices, beef may soon be what's affordable for dinner. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. Marvel Technology shares plunge on news of an internal probe, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The firm disclosing today that it has launched an internal investigation into its revenue recognition practices. The company also says it will report a loss in the second quarter. Shares tumbled 16 percent to $8.84. Target is cutting ties with the apparel maker Cherokee Corporation. The retailer decided not to renew its license with the company, which expires in 2017. That's a big blow to Cherokee, which got nearly half of its total revenue from Target last year. Cherokee slid 38 percent to 14.82. Target rose 1 percent to 77.88. Meanwhile, Kroger saw its earnings rise by 25 percent last quarter. As sales were better than expected, the grocery chain also hiked its full year outlook. Shares jumped by 5 percent as a result of $37.29. And mattress firm disappointed with a miss on both the top and bottom lines. That company also slashed its full year earnings outlook, blaming uncertainty in the oil markets as one of the reasons. Shares of mattress firm plunged by 23 percent today to $46.24. And now to our market monitor who likes some small cap names that he says have big growth potential. He is Andrew Morey and he is, runs the Alston LMGC $7 billion small cap growth fund, which is up nearly 10 percent over the past year. He's a Morningstar rated five star fund manager and this is his first time on the program. Welcome. It's nice to have you here, Andrew. Great. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's start with your stock picks, because uh, I'm fascinated by some of them. Sotheby's is one with a price target on it between 48 and $50 a piece. Why do you like the stock? Great. Well, Sotheby's uh, has relatively new management, a new CEO who's implemented some cost controls. Um, we're seeing some early returns of that already. Uh, they actually declared a relatively large sherry purchase in the summer. And maybe most importantly for Sotheby's, it is an auction house. We all know about it. Uh, the fall auctions, we have some early indications there's going to be quite a lot of art coming to auction, and that should help revenue growth and uh, earnings per share. So, again, uh, we think $50 plus uh, is in the cards for Sotheby's. It's actually pulled back recently, so we think it's timely. You're bullish, we should say, on housing and the automotive industry uh, in this economy right now. And in representing automotives, you like this company, Lithia Motors. Why them? Yeah, so Lithia Motors, again, a Midwestern and Western uh, regional, a little bit more suburban uh, and rural uh, car dealer, uh, growing, again, with auto sales, as we've seen, now 17 million plus for units in the U.S., so obviously they've benefited from that. They've also done some uh, acquisitions of uh, more one-off dealers, uh, whether it be legacy uh, families looking to uh, sell and monetize their interests or even larger entities. That has been relatively very accretive, so growing earnings per share and cash flow even more. Uh, we see more of that in the future for Lithia. All right, let's finish up with Synchronous Technologies. Uh, it's been a top 10 stock in your portfolio for some time now. Tell us why you like it. Yeah. So Synchronous provides activation and cloud services to many different wireless uh, providers. So think of it as the Verizon wirelesses and AT&T wirelesses. So when a consumer goes in and, and gets one of the newest iPhones, and uh, buys that over the web from Apple or gets it from their uh, Verizon or AT&T provider and activates that. Verizon uh, or AT&T actually doesn't activate that phone. That's actually synchronous doing it for them for a fee. So needless to say, with all the new smartphones being sold, uh, that will benefit synchronous again. Uh, and also, as you and I store more things uh, in the cloud via our mobile device, whether it be music, uh, video, movies, uh, contacts, all of that, again, 
uh, Synchronous would store and Verizon or uh, AT&T Wireless would pay them for it. Okay. So again, very much a growth area, uh, and we see that uh, continuing further. All right, Andrew, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Andrew Morey with the Aston LMCG Small Cap Growth Fund. Well, the marijuana industry is quickly transforming into big business, and more states legalize its use. And soon there will be a new medicinal dispensary in the Big Apple. Kate Rogers introduces us to the entrepreneurs behind that shop. If there's any doubt about where the national momentum is headed on legalized marijuana usage, think about this. Come January 2016, there will be a medicinal marijuana dispensary right off of Union Square in New York City. The store will be run by Columbia Care, which also has operations in Washington, D.C. and Arizona. It's one of the five companies awarded a license to operate in New York State under the 2014 Compassionate Care Act. CEO Nicholas Vita, a former investment banker at Goldman Sachs, says they're looking to legitimize the conversation about medicinal marijuana and its uses. We really want to focus on the, uh, the discussions around uh, dosing, around efficacy, uh, and around the medical use of, of, of marijuana rather than uh, the sort of the political aspects of a uh, recreational or adult use uh, decision process. New York is hardly the first state to legalize medicinal usage of marijuana. 22 other states in Washington, D.C. have already done so. The first state to legalize medical cannabis was California in 1996, and four of those states have legalized pot for recreational use. Another company that was awarded a license is Illinois-based Pharmacanis. It was founded by two husband-wife duos with legal and professional backgrounds. We believe very much um, that it's important to provide education to communities, to physicians, to patients in terms of what the program is all about. And that's something that we incorporated into our application. The competition within New York State was really steep with 43 companies applying. Each of the five that were selected will have one manufacturing facility and four dispensaries across New York State, operational sometime in January 2016. But there's one thing about the New York law. You can't smoke the cannabis, but among the approved uses are ingesting it orally via oil and pill form. For Nightly Business Report in Union Square in New York City, I'm Kate Rogers. Coming up, Wall Street remembers and gives back. That story is next. was a day of remembrance as the nation marked the 14th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. All across the country, flags were at half-staff. In Washington, President and Mrs. Obama observed a moment of silence outside the White House. And in New York, the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq observed a one-minute moment of silence to remember those who lost their lives that day. And no trading firm was hurt more than Cantor Fitzgerald. The investment bank lost a third of its employees in the September 11th attacks. But instead of folding, the firm rebuilt and kept a financial promise to the families of its employees, distributing $180 million in revenue to them and paying for their health care for 10 years. Today, the firm pays it forward in another way, holding an annual charity day to raise money for other causes. Mary Thompson reports from Cantor's headquarters in New York. At Cantor Fitzgerald, one client gets some tough love for an easy trade from model Christy Turlington. We need you to buy two million, this one, utility, utility debt. debt. The money the investment bank makes on this day goes to charity, part of an annual event honoring the 658 employees it lost on 9-11, including CEO Howard Lutnick and Edie Lutnick's brother Gary. The thing about us is that our, our personal tragedy was very, very public. But the reality is that everybody goes through tragedy and trauma one way or another. And probably the largest lesson that I've learned is that if you can find something larger than yourself to focus on in the face of that tragedy, you will not only heal, but you can do spectacular things. Edie Lutnick runs Canner's Relief Fund, which raises money each year on 9-11 with the help of all-star traders like baseball great Alex Rodriguez. Brokers gave me some great advice not to hang up the phone until the deal is closed. 
and actor Michael J. Fox. Today they've really been pressing me. I mean, some money has been changing hands. I've been affecting the economy. Fox and Rodriguez, among the luminaries from sports and entertainment, who talked to Cantor clients, who in turn funneled their business to the firm. Seven million, here it is. Yay! Cantor then distributes the money it makes on the trades to charities, like supermodel Petra Nemkova's Happy Hearts, which builds schools in disaster areas. Cantor Fitzgerald's held seven charity days, raising over $120 million. The firm's response to its own tragedy, inspiring comedian Whoopi Goldberg to become a broker for a day. They still got up and gave a damn about everything else in the world and said, you're not going to keep us down. And I just wanted to be part of that grace. CEO Howard Lutnick survived 9-11 because he took his oldest son to school that day. 14 years on, he says he honors those who died and those they left behind by doing what he does best. I can't help them in any other way other than financially, because that's what I'm good at. So we rebuilt the company in order to help the families. That was the most important thing to me. 51 children of Cantor employees who died on 9-11 now work for the firm, getting a chance to honor their parents' legacy each day with work and each year with work and charity. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in New York. And you know, that area of New York City, that lower area that was so devastated by the right. attacks has come back in a big way. Oh, yes. The population of that area on September 11th of 2001 was 20,000. Today, it is 70,000 people, a lot of families moving and in that area. And it's so now. good to see that, that yep. rebirth, if you will. Exactly. All right, that does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you again on Monday.